Come on in, welcome to Idled Out, where we talk all things Survivor. My name is Luke, and today we're talking about my 10 favorite episodes in Survivor history. We've spent the last two weeks looking at the 10 best and 10 worst episodes of Survivor, as determined by the people. IMDB user ratings. And along the way, many of you wondered in the comments what my 10 favorite episodes are, so I thought I'd share. Today, there's nothing democratic about it. These are my 10 personal favorite episodes of Survivor, encompassing everything from universally beloved classics to underrated deep cuts, premieres and finales, and everything in between across all eras of Survivor. Obviously, there are dozens of perfect episodes of Survivor and hundreds more great ones. So tough cuts were made, and not every classic season is represented here, let alone every classic episode. Micronesia fans, please put away the knives. Remember, this is just my personal opinion. One bit of housekeeping, I will keep this list to one episode per season in the interest of wider representation. But let me know what seasons and episodes I'm missing in the comments. All that said, let's take a look at my 10 personal favorite episodes in Survivor history. At number 10 is Jackets and Eggs, episode 5 of Survivor, David vs. Goliath. You've gotta love an episode title that just does away with the traditional naming convention and just tells you what the episode is about. There are jackets, there are eggs, and there are arguments about both. This is the Natalie boot in David vs. Goliath, where she gets into petty fights with everyone on the tribe, then is voted out of the game, jacket in hand. To be a fly on the wall of post-swap Jabeni. I've said this before about this tribe, but when Lyrsa is the least entertaining member of a tribe, it's a good tribe. This episode is just wildly entertaining social politics, centering around the Goliath majority of Mike and Angelina debating a vote out of their ally Natalie for the negative morale she brings to camp. And even as Mike and Angelina do decide to cut bait on Natalie, Angelina comes up with a cockamamie scheme to get Natalie's jacket on her way out the door. Throw her vote on Lyrsa. And then... Sorry, girl. Natalie, is there any way I could have your jacket? <laughs> Natalie? This post swap grouping of five is the kind of survivor alchemy that we just rarely see on this show, and all post swap tribes should aspire to be so train wrecky. I mean that genuinely. The people who got out of this all made the final three. At number nine is Telenovela, episode 12 of Survivor 43. Easily the best episode of the new era so far, this is the penultimate episode of 43, where Cody learns a very tough lesson on trust and friendship when he gets brutally blindsided by his closest ally in the game. A lot of this episode focuses on Jesse's moral dilemma of taking out not only an ally, but a friend in about as humiliating a manner as you can go out in Survivor. In other seasons, this might have been portrayed as just straight up mustache twirling villainy, but Jesse's decision is given weight and nuance. Cody had previously given Jesse his idol out of fear of the knowledge's power advantage, but Cody requests his own idol from Jesse to show to Carla at the last second. So the entire plan later hinges on Jesse being able to get Cody to give him back the idol, injecting some last minute uncertainty. At Tribal, Jesse plays Cody's idol on Owen, Carla plays her idol on herself, and Cody knows he's been screwed. The tension hanging in the air when Jesse goes to shake Cody's hand with the same hand he stabbed him in the back with. Survivor 43 spent so much time investing in the relationship between these two and cashed in all the chips right here. It's the season's biggest blindside of all. Other than, you know, the entire narrative leading to Pookie Palm Frond Man winning. 
At number eight is We're a Hot Mess, episode four of Survivor, San Juan del Sur. One of my favorite genres of Survivor episodes is the downfall episode, where the show spends its runtime not setting up two or three players as targets, but only setting up one, and there is little, if any, question of who's going home at the end of the episode. Your Rogers, your Randys, your Garretts, there have been some greats, but Survivor never did this better than the downfall of Drew Christie, the poster boy for Survivor recruit. Drew's ego was greater than his game sense, and this episode made sure to stuff in every gloating, cocksure quote they could to make him look as bad as possible. We need to start getting rid of some of the snakes on our tribe. So, um, basically, I'm a badass and a manipulator of this game. <laughs> Look, I don't mean to dissuade future players from giving us such gold, but if you say stuff like this, they will only ever use it against you. On the chronically winning Hunapu tribe, Drew comes up with a scheme to throw the upcoming immunity challenge to get out the biggest threat in the game, a threat no one else can see, only him, Kelly Wentworth. This is played for laughs on the show. Kelly had had only two confessionals up to this point, and most audience members probably didn't even know who she was, and she would have little impact on the rest of the season. But Kelly's allies quickly turn things around, and at Tribal Council, Drew learns what we already know. He's getting blindsided. The best part? Knowing what we know now about Kelly Wentworth, in hindsight, Drew Christie was right all along. Justice for Drew. At number seven is The End of Innocence, episode five of Survivor Marquesas. This is the swan song not only for Gabriel, the only member of the Rotu tribe to go home pre-merge, but also for an entire type of Survivor guy in general, the dude who's just there for the experience. Gabriel came to Survivor explicitly not to play the game. He wanted to build a new society, he wanted to hang out on the beach and vibe. Gabriel's energy was a big reason why Rotu was so successful and why they were the love tribe. But in this episode, the honeymoon is over. Gabriel refused to pledge allegiance to the larger Rotu alliance, and John in particular, and he spent a lot of time hanging out with Sean and Rob, members of the minority alliance post-swap. His votes were going to be unpredictable, he was a huge athletic threat, he had a good heart and not an ounce of strategy, which is why he could go no further, not with sharks like Boston Rob and John Carroll around. It's just a great episode of Survivor all around, and there was no going back to a more naive time after this one. It's the close of the first chapter of Survivor. Plus, there's a very goofy immunity challenge where the tribes have to make an SOS. Pascal's outfit is worth the price of admission alone. Not sure I would have gone with the white hood myself. At number six is Head of the Snake. Episode 6 of Survivor, Kageyan. The first of two episodes on my list that are also on the IMDb Top 10, this is the merge episode of Kageyan, where Sarah positions herself as the swing vote between the two alliances, and ultimately swings herself right out of the game. A lot of this episode is about the two main alliances competing for Sarah's loyalty, and Sarah relishes this position using her perceived power to try to get her way with the Solana Alliance. Sarah's attempts to railroad Solana into her preferred boot, in particular upsets Cass, who flips on her to vote her out in what may be the most roller coaster tribal council ever, as Tony and LJ play idols on each other, Jeff returns out to be the boot instead, but Cass flipped to take out Sarah, rendering all of that obsolete. When this episode aired, Survivor was just coming out of an era where there had been an over-reliance on returnees. They'd been present in five of the last six seasons, and there were a lot of expectations on this newbie cast to deliver. Lest we go back to the dark days where everyone and their mother, quite literally, could get an offer to return. This season, and this episode in particular, was a breath of fresh air. 
Who needs returnees when you've got Tony scrambling, Trish strategizing, cast flipping, dual failed idol plays, an unexpected blindside, and smug looks getting wiped off Spencer's face? Not me. At number five is Spirits and the Final Four, the finale of Survivor Vanuatu. There's a lot I love in this finale. The epic multi-story Final Four challenge, Chris's I don't give a f face when Eliza is voted out, that inspired Final Endurance challenge, Chris playing Twyla right up until the moment they walk into Final Tribal. But for me, this is in my top five because of that Final Tribal Council. It's the best of all time. Despite surface level similarities, Chris and Twyla could not be more different finalists. He's a BS artist for the ages who has the jury eating out of the palm of his hand with his crocodile tears. She's too sincere for her own good, and I'm hanging on every word they both say. I feel just like answer the I've question. I just want to I want to hear the answer to your question. Why are you sitting there? Why am I standing here? Maybe a little bit more harder, a little bit more colder maybe. You don't have it in you. And I have it. The great irony is that survivor juries say they want honesty, but often they just want atonement. And the juxtaposition between that is on full display right here, between Twyla and Chris. This finale truly captures everything Survivor is about to me. Great challenges, fascinating human beings, high emotions, and probes taking the final votes, flying all the way from Vanuatu to LA in this rinky-dink plane, skydive out, and then driving the votes to the live reunion. It truly has it all. At number four is For Cod's Sake, episode five of Survivor Exile Island. This is the Bobby boot episode and a dark horse contender for funniest episode of Survivor of all time. Survivor knew they had gold with the Kasaya tribe, a post-swap tribal cocktail of the most volatile and entertaining personalities of the season. And this is their episode through and through. We only go to boring, sleepy Lamina for two brief scenes. Every scene at Kasaya is straight out of a comedy movie. During a stormy night, Bruce and Bobby get iced out of the shelter, and so they steal some wine the tribe won in a reward, and hop in the outhouse, get hammered, and talk about how much they hate everyone else. Not to be outdone, the rest of Kasaya is also on fire. Courtney doing yoga in front of Bruce's Zen Rock Garden while he's building it is some of the most unintentionally funny stuff ever put on reality TV. Danielle would railroad the tribe into voting out Bobby here in the most Kasaya vote of all time, a scattershot vote where he gets less than half the votes, depriving us of a guy who would undoubtedly have been a future all-star. But even with the bummer of a boot, like a lot of Exile Island, this episode is still just endlessly rewatchable for how funny Kasaya is. If I could inject myself into any scene in Survivor history, well, shove me in that outhouse with Bruce, Bobby, and that bottle of wine. At number three is Beg, Barter, and Steal, the first episode of Survivor Pearl Island. This is probably the best premiere of all time. It gets everything right, right out of the gate. Beginning with the cast jumping ship in their press day clothes and washing up on the shores of a Panamanian village where they can barter for supplies with a small amount of cash, the characters and the season's pirate theme are on full display. Sandra bartering with locals in Spanish is obviously a highlight. Naive, hapless Austin sells all his clothes. But has there ever been a better introduction to a character than Rupert gleefully stealing the other tribe's shoes? I don't think so. And if you're wondering where our other main character of the season, Johnny Fairplay, is in all of this, don't worry. He shows up later that night. Where are the teenage girls? <laughs> Camp Life spends time contrasting the leadership styles between Rupert and Savage, and the episode concludes with a great immunity challenge where the Drake tribe wins immunity by a hair. I'll let you decide what kind. Admittedly, the Nicole vote at Morgan isn't super exciting, but prior to that, from casting to theming to editing, this episode is just Survivor at its creative best, and remains to this day the benchmark for season openers. Anyone could see that. 
even if a Panamanian shopkeep took your eyes. At number two is Banana Etiquette, episode six of Survivor, Heroes vs. Villains, the second of two episodes that are both in my top 10 and the IMDb top 10. This is a truly unforgettable episode, one of the most entertaining episodes of Survivor start to finish. And whether you watch this show for the characters or the strategy, there's something for ya. Even in the seams, every scene is gold. The early morning Rob and Russell showdown at the start of the episode is intentionally framed like something out of an old John Wayne Western, with Sheriff Rob telling the outlaw Russell Hans to watch his back, and Russell returning that warning. This island isn't big enough. Actually, you know what? I'll just let Rob say it. This island ain't big enough for the both of us. With his allies Tom and Stephanie gone, Colby is perhaps at his depressed best here. He truly is the saddest sack. But what makes this episode legendary is the combination of Tyson voting himself out by changing his vote to Parvati on a split vote, as well as Amanda explaining the concept of manners to James, the titular banana etiquette. Yeah, it's but so... when you get a banana, you get one for everyone else. It's like an etiquette. Really? Yes. Tyson's self limb and Russell's ballsy idol play on Parvati have both rightly gone down in Survivor lore, but so has something as simple as basic island politics, like asking people if they'd like a banana. And James learned this the hard way. Remember to practice safe banana etiquette at home now, everyone. My personal favorite episode in Survivor history is... The Martyr Approach, episode 15 of Survivor Token Chains. It's an expected result, but can you blame me? Coach has spent this entire season deathly afraid of going to exile, and he's trotted out every excuse in the book to avoid it. Here at the final five, we finally get the payoff we've been waiting for all season, when JT wins reward and exiles Coach. They knew they had one shot at this exile visit, and they did not miss. Swelling music, epic helicopter shots, eagle screeches, a dragon cane, and Coach Chi atop the sand dunes. This is, for my money, the most entertaining sequence ever on this show. An epic, over-the-top, audience-winking visit to exile that was well worth the wait. No wonder they scrapped the entire concept of Exile Island the next season. How could you ever top this? Even better is when we check in on Coach the next day. To obscure his future exile struggles, Coach vowed to take the monastic approach there, or martyr approach as Aaron calls it, and not eat or drink water while on exile, the next day result of which is him laying in the water, looking like E.T. when he's dying. The martyr approach leads to further dramatics at immunity, where Coach collapses, after making sure everyone knows how hard he's trying. This is Coach's swan song, and in a rare moment of self-awareness, even he knew it. So he busts out a poem he wrote right before the votes are cast, ever the showman, even up until the last second. Frankly put, no one has ever been as entertaining on this show as Coach in Token Sheens, and the entire episode belongs to him, front to back. Cue the eagle screech. Got nothing else for ya. What did you think of my top 10 and what is yours? Let me know in the comments. Until next time, don't get idled out.